Hello and welcome to Theology Unleashed, the channel where Eastern theology meets Western skepticism. Today I've got Michael Kramer on, the author of Forbidden Archaeology, uh, Human Devolution and a few other notable books. And we're going to be talking about when science becomes a religion or uh, when scientists get into a religious headspace and start using religious arguments. So, uh, Michael Kramer, thanks for coming on. Good, good to be with you. So I did one of these a few weeks ago with Professor Edward Dutton, and uh, I, I used that title. And the way I started it was to talk about how it's frustrating when you're discussing with someone, you know, giving arguments against evolution, for example, uh, against common descent. And the person will say, oh, no, it has to be true because the scientists say it's true or most of the science agrees. Therefore, it has to be true. And that strikes me as a religious argument. It's, it's not really a scientific argument. Um, Professor Edward Dutton agreed and he rambled on about ways in which the scientific institutions have kind of come undone. So you've written this book, uh, Forbidden Archaeology, where you showed how the, the, the way data is handled in the scientific communities is inconsistent and it's contingent on whether it fits with an existing theory or not, which is sort of something you might see a religious institution doing with data. Well... Yes, and this has been recognized by uh, science studies scholars. When I say science studies, I mean uh, people in disciplines like history of science and philosophy of science and sociology of science who study how science operates. And basically, uh, well, i give it one example. Bill Lynch, a science studies professor at a university in the United States. He's written a book called Minority Report. And in there, he kind of speaks about the phenomenon that you're talking about. Uh, scientists operate on the basis of authority, their authority. They, if ultimately uh, someone in the public wants to say something about evolution or cosmology or consciousness, any, any topic, the ultimate authority is going to be science in today's, today's world. So how does that authority come about? It is in some sense, uh, you could say, similar to the authority that religionists claim, except uh, they, they have a different source of, of, of their knowledge. But the, the religionists claim that they're being true to the source which usually is some divine personality or supreme being as the ultimate guarantor of, of knowledge. Uh, scientists claim to be faithful to the facts, the observed facts, but who has the authority to interpret what the facts of nature really are? Well. Bill Lynch says it's basically a self-appointed group of experts. You, know, you have to be an expert in a particular field, but who determines who's the expert? Well, the experts. And you can only become an expert by being trained by the existing experts. So uh, that consensus among an inner core group in a scientific discipline becomes, in today's world, the ultimate authority, which uh, is the same kind of claim that religionists will, will, will make. He, he kind of calls it cognitive authoritarianism which is a phrase he got from his professor who supervised his graduate studies, uh, Stephen Fuller, 
who's uh, an another very interesting person in the science studies field. Uh, um, I would like to think that the experts, at some point, they earned their prestige for genuine reasons. And then later uh, on, maybe the power kind of got in the way of the science being done well. Was well, this... Uh, I, I was going to let you finish your point. Yeah, um, so Edward Dutton spoke about um, how, like the universities, for example, they, they're at least historically have been prestigious. People look to the universities to find meaning in life, to find answers. If you have a, a, if you're university educated, that means something. At least it used to. But these days, less and less does that actually mean something, and less and less can universities be trusted for truth sources. And the way Edward Dutton explains what went on is the genius types, uh, like Einstein and so on, they make discoveries that you know they they have this autistic focus on truth so they don't really care what anyone thinks about it they they just care about the truth they're not even they probably don't even care about their own prestige they just want to figure out what the how the world ticks and these people enter into the universities they get recognized by the universities or they're trained through the universities and they get given positions in the universities and the presence of these people in the universities is why the universities are prestigious but then as time goes on what he calls the midwits uh, start running the show. So then they're not the genius types with the autistic focus on truth. They're sort of halfway intelligent. So they're, they're somewhat intelligent. That's why they're able to work in a university, but they're not these genius types. And they kind of m mess things up a little bit so that the, the truth uh, se seeking is not so honest and sincere and rigorous. And then the universities start to come undone. Well, it's interesting that most universities began as religious institutions. Um, certainly true in England, you know, Oxford, Cambridge, they all started as, uh, uh, as training colleges for people going into the professions, including the uh, clergy profession. But the, the, the schools were all run under the controller influence of the Church of England. In the United States, you find a similar phenomenon. Most of the early colleges were started by religious organizations, churches of various kinds. But um, Stephen Fuller makes an interesting distinction. If, if we're saying that in some ways uh, modern academics, whether in the sciences or uh, social studies fields, act as if they were a religious institution in the sense of uh, demanding respect for their authority to speak authoritatively on different topics. We have to ask, well, what kind of religion is it? Is it more like the Catholic religion, which had a single doctrine, which was uh, expected to be followed by everyone? Or is it more like the Protestant? variety of Christianity where you have many different schools of thought with everyone entitled to their own reading of scripture. So in the world of science, it used to be considered even by historians of science and philosophers of science and other science studies uh, people to be more Catholic in the sense that there's one scientific method, one scientific view of things that should be accepted as authoritative. What happened in the mid to late 20th century and continuing on to the present was uh, another view of science that there could be multiple worldviews, multiple epistemologies operating in the world of 
science and this uh, scientists were perceived not as acolytes or clergy of one uh, unified vision of truth but more in a Protestant way as having uh, different readings of of uh, you could say the scripture of nature but uh, that originally was sort of confined within the academic world, you know, a very narrow circle of philosophers of science and historians of science like uh, Kuhn and others were calling into question the idea that scientists were actually observing and presenting to the world objective facts rather they began to see things in terms of well scientists are people they have interests they have biases they have and that enters into their scientific work now as, as long as that was confined that kind of skepticism was confined to the narrow circle of academics it wasn't so much of a problem but it began leaking out into the world in general and it became part of a general skepticism among people about all kinds of institutions and authorities uh, whether they were getting the real facts from them so when that started happening there was a, a reaction within the academic community to the postmodernist types of historians of science sociologists of science philosophers of science who were raising these doubts so bill lynch proposed something interesting he said well yeah there are always going to be alternative points of view uh, when compared to the mainstream consensus in science or a scientific discipline the question is how are the members of the consensus group going to deal with the smaller minority groups who hold different opinions about scientific topics and uh, one way is just to use your authority and power to marginalize and uh, eliminate them another is well to look at the different minority proposals and see who among those who are proposing them have some insight that accounts for some evidence or some problem that the main consensus group has not been able to solve and actually this does happen in the world of science uh, you know, Darwin, when he started out, was in the minority. Uh, the, the, the mainstream consensus among academics during uh, the early 19th century was creationism. That was what was being taught in the English universities. And Darwin, in his introduction to his first edition of Origin of Species, said, well, I used to be in that group as well. But now I've come up with a different idea, and I like it considered. And although he started out in a minority, his ideas today are the mainstream consensus. So. Uh, I, I, I think that that is uh, good advice for reformers in the church of science, you might say, to take into consideration if uh, <clears throat> one 
thinks one has an idea that is a candidate for becoming eventually the consensus view, then uh, one is obliged to present it in such a way that it solves some problem that previously has escaped solution. Yeah, that second way of dealing with uh, dissenters or people with alternative views, that sounds like actually doing science. <laughs> um, so, I mean, there's a number of things the defender of just accepting the consensus might want to say in reply. Like one of them might be, well, the experts, they can look at the dissenting views and assess them, but us lay people, we, we don't have the training or knowledge that necessary to be able to assess the competing theories so we just have to accept the consensus even if it's wrong it's the best we can do uh we'll be, we'll be more, more right more of the time if we just go along with what most of the experts are saying than if we use our own feeble understanding to try to piece something together well that is all right if one is open and explicitly says that's what one is doing uh, if one creates the illusion that there are no contending con contenders for truth other than what is now the mainstream consensus, uh, I, I, I don't think that is a, a very good way to proceed. If one acknowledges, okay, today the consensus is this, and there are others who are proposing alternatives, we're going to go along with the consensus for now. That that might be okay, but uh, yeah, there are you know philosophers and historians of science like Paul Feyerabend and his book uh, against method you know he makes the point that it's good to have a pluralistic concept uh, of, of uh, different ways of approaching a problem sometimes it takes what he called counter induction uh, the adoption of a of a view outside the mainstream consensus to give you a true evaluation of the strength of that consensus. So it's, you know, it's, a, it's an interesting way of approaching things, looking at things from different points of view may give you a better perspective on, on even what the mainstream consensus is really saying uh, that what you just said there is making me think of an analogy of like uh, you could have uh, a, a creature which you know when it when it's in its infancy you have to shelter it so it doesn't get eaten alive or something um, and you could think of this as you know what you do do with a new theory or something but if if you have to do that the entire time then maybe the creature is just not fit for survival so if the mainstream consensus theory has to be sheltered from objections for its entire existence, then maybe something's wrong with it. But if you can present all of the strongest objections against it, you know, like that, like the um, Discovery Institute, their, their uh, whole thing they're pushing for is teach the controversy. So they don't want creationism shoved down people's throats in the education system. They just want the objections. And the fact that there's people who disagree and have strong arguments against the theory of evolution to be taught to, alongside teaching the theory of evolution. So here's the theory, and here's the arguments against the theory. And I mean, this is a traditional education. You, 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 um, you know, the Greek philosophers would rip ideas apart. Someone would present something. Someone else would tear it to shreds. And uh, a lot of university mm -hmm. was like that. People were trained to uh, interrogate ideas, uh, at, but. Off, and some some ideas are seemingly sheltered from that kind of interrogation, which 
is either because the idea is weak or there's some insecurity about the idea is weak, being weak or it's a religious thing that even if there's a small chance somebody could end up disbelieving it as a result of presenting these objections, uh, we better not present the objections. Yes, well, all of the science studies scholars I've just cited over the past few minutes have basically said something that is very much in line with what 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 you said that um, you know for example Thomas Nagel you know philosopher of science at New York University you know he 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 wrote a a, a book in which he proposed basically that he said you know you got these people of the intelligent design school, they're proposing something, an evidence-based analysis that doesn't really go along with the present mainstream consensus. So why, why should they uh, be uh, just totally marginalized in the way that's being done without actually dealing with their arguments. So, or Paul Feyerabend, he more or less said, you know, the same thing. Stephen Fuller as, as well. Um, and then, as I said, there was Bill Lynch who was saying, okay, one approach is to have kind of an affirmative action approach towards minority views, like in in politics today and social life, minorities are protected, you know, whether they're minorities in a gender sense or a political sense or a, uh, any other sense. Yeah, you know, the the tendency in today's society is while well, you give those minorities some protection, some representation, uh, some uh, opportunities for employment. And Stephen Fuller has more or less proposed a, a similar idea in terms of education and academic life and scientific life that um, the persons with minority views, I mean, as long as they're not advocating something that is just totally destructive and, you know, that, that takes you into another realm, but uh, as long as they're operating with, within, you know, a, an academic type of framework, they should be encouraged and uh, supported to some extent. And, uh, but then there's the other idea that, well, just let, it's a more Darwinian idea, let the minority ideas either survive or perish according to their ability to function within the current you know, academic scientific environment. Well, I so. think the, the survive or perish thing would rely on people, on there being an actual free marketplace of ideas. It, the, it wouldn't work if it was the case that, yeah, sure, anyone can present any idea they want and we're calling it a free marketplace. But if you're a, a professor in a university and you endorse one of these minority views, you can say goodbye to getting any grant money for future research or career progression opportunities, and you might even lose your job. Yeah, well, things may change uh, somewhat. Uh, a couple of months ago, I attended a conference called Science and Consciousness. It's uh, It was put on near Tucson, Arizona, it's organized every couple of years by uh, a, a consciousness studies group at the University of Arizona. It's a, a big event for 
neuroscientists, cognitive scientists, philosophers, and others that come to talk about consciousness. And one of the keynote speakers this past uh, year was David Chalmers, who's a philosopher of science. And I think he's at New York University now. Uh, but he was famous for introducing uh, the phrase, the hard problem of consciousness, which means what we do with consciousness, with our intelligence, is fairly easy to model in terms of computer science and so on and so forth. Like you can teach a computer to play chess very well and even beat grandmasters. But can that computer be conscious? Can it have a center of self-awareness, subjective self-awareness, that problem of where does consciousness come from, that experience, how do you get that out of neurons or uh, computer circuits? There, there hasn't been any solution to that problem. But he brought up recently he's been getting into uh, virtual worlds you know simulated realities virtual realities mm -hmm. and although he says he was an atheist he he said he'd been influenced by simulated worlds simulated realities digital alternative realities to see how in a rational scientific way you could conceive of a designer, a conscious self that's outside the system, because basically that's how virtual reality systems work. Uh, a person, a conscious person outside the system is put into it by different interfaces like the Oculus VR headsets and things like that. By, by some means, their presence is introduced into the system, but the system itself doesn't produce the consciousness, the awareness, or even introduces these personalities into that digital realm. So he considers this simulated reality technology to be, even though he's an atheist, he says it's the strongest argument or evidence he's seen for uh, inducing people to seriously consider the idea of God, uh, the soul, different things like that. So uh, that would be interesting if, if that sort of concept became more widespread. Right. So are you saying if, if that kind of argument was lodged in people's minds more and they were more, more open to considering these other theories about the foundation of reality that then there might be this less of this uh, system where we have in universities right now where some ideas are considered taboo if a university professor suddenly said they believed in flat earth or didn't, disbelieved in the theory of evolution, they, they might have their career impeded Sometimes the surrounding culture uh, will gradually influence what goes on in the institutions embedded within that larger culture. And you know, this is one of the elements of, you could say, the postmodernist approach uh, or the, the dominant science studies approach to uh, science. 
you know, that it isn't totally separated from the surrounding culture. It depends upon it for funding, depends upon it for goodwill. Yeah, it, it, yeah there, there are a lot of considerations there. So this uh, phenomenon of simulated worlds, virtual reality is becoming more widespread in the whole worldwide uh, technological culture that we're embedded in. So it may also influence what goes on in the in educational and scientific institutions as well. Yeah, right. That that makes sense. Like I heard recently, I think it was a bank in Australia came out saying something that they're they were talking about some technology where they could microchip, put microchips in people, and they mentioned putting microchips in children, uh, and uh, and then lots of people wrote to the bank saying this is not cool. I'm closing my account. Uh, and then the bank put out a statement, oh, saying, we, oh, we were just talking about the technology. We were having a neutral stance on it. We weren't pushing for it. But you look back at the article mm -hmm. and they were kind of talking about how great it sounded. Um, but then when all the customers got upset, they, they changed their tune pretty quick. So something yeah. similar to that could go on with universities. I mean, already we see that happening. Like Evergreen State University had a huge debacle with firing Brett Weinstein and a big protest there because, you know, some crazy um what's, what's the word um affirmative action theories on race and he's like no this this is racism against white people we we can't do that and there was everyone got upset but um and the president there didn't allow the police to come in for the protest and you know they're continuing to push these uh unscientific theories large largely um but their enrollment has tanked so the university's in a really bad, bad financial position Whereas another university in America, which um, like sometimes in these universities in America, somebody will, will dress up in a Halloween costume and then someone will decide it's offensive and a whole mob will go after them. And, uh, and uh, in one particular case, the president of the university said, no, <laughs> I'm not going along with the mob here. It's just a Halloween costume. It's fine. Uh, and... And that, that was actually successful. Uh, he, he was successful in doing that. And the, that uni particular university is having lots of en enrollments and activity. Uh, whereas some other universities that have caved to the woke mob have had their enrollments crash. So some of these times, these ideas which are popular and gaining traction in the universities are, are not actually popular as we can see by the number of people enrolling. So. That's just an example of how what public opinion, where public opinion sits, um, does matter. And eventually, if these universities continue to be unscientific, they will lose enrollment numbers to a degree which will seriously impact them. Yeah, I I think the 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 real problem comes in when some individual or group attempts to use some. Uh, authority system, whether it's government, departments, or the administration of a university to compel others to uh, believe or accept something. You know, in other words, impose a truth on, on, on people. So I, I think that's whether that comes from, you know, religion or any other group in society, any other political or educational or intellectual group that tries to use force to impose its ideas on others, that that is problematic. Yeah, I like I think I like to think of it in terms of like the marketplace of ideas and then you mentioned earlier how some crazy ideas maybe shouldn't get a hearing and I think that the margins beyond where those sit 
are pretty objectively defined. You know, maybe exactly where to draw the boundary uh, might be questionable or um, subjective. But we all know that, like, some of the ideas the Nazi had, that, that's too far. And we, we can all think of ideas that are too far and all agree these ideas are too far and should not get a hearing. Uh, but within those margins, there's a wide diversity of ideas that should get a hearing and should just be a free marketplace. So the best university professors, the best books, uh, in my experience, are always ones that are, you know, here's this idea, here's the arguments for it, here's the arguments against it, make up your own mind. And anytime you read a book that's like, here's my idea, I'm going to straw man all the arguments against it and tell you why you should believe my idea. Oh, and also, you're stupid if you don't agree with me. Mm -hmm. It's not such a good book when they do that, right? Yeah. Yeah. I, yeah. Th these issues were discussed by uh, Paul Feyerab in, in his book, Science in a Free Society. You know, he was mentioning many of the ideas that you've mentioned, like this free market of ideas. You know, he, he pointed out that, you know, various, you know, there are various cosmologies. There's a, a modern scientific cosmology, which is very physicalist, you know, matter is the only thing that exists and so on. So there are other cosmologies who have different ideas, you know, different ontologies and epistemologies. And they could also be competitors in that free market of ideas, but they're not allowed to participate. You know, you could participate as, yes, you may be from a certain cultural background, but if you get educated in our consensus, scientific consensus, then you can be part of it. You know, there, in other words, they think they're be, being democratic in that way, that anybody from whatever background can be part of our thing if they undergo education in that idea. But that's different than, you know, saying, well, you have your ideas and you have a right to them and it, it should be discussed. And which one comes out on top, or which one gets the most adherence? Well, that's up to the free market of 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 ideas. So, I mean, he said, Paul Feyerabend said, just like there's separation between church and state, you know, the state doesn't favor or disfavor any particular religion. Uh, it should also be separation between science and, and state, where the state doesn't favor to the exclusion of any other uh, view within the scientific world, one view over another. Just let it be worked out. Yeah, I think... In the free marketplace of ideas. I think we could compare it to hate speech laws. So you can have laws against incitement to violence because there's, there's nothing subjective about it. If, you know, if I'm saying, I disagree with the prime minister, let's all get a mob with our pick, pick axes and, and go to her house and destroy it. Yes. That, that's, a, that's a criminal activity if I'm inciting people to go and do that. And it should be. Um, but... But if I just want to say, I disagree with this particular idea and here's why, that's something else. But, and with, with hate, but with hate speech laws, they can write them in such a way that whoever is in, in political power can just use the hate speech laws uh, to silence their political opponents. And that's not, yes. that's not a safe world to live in. So even if the people who are currently in power are not going to abuse that power, having that system in place means you never know who's going to be in power next and whether they'll abuse that or not and the ability to express a dissenting view is so important so um, 
yeah, so the point here I'm making is that th there's no way we can define hate speech laws uh, within that margin uh, any further without it being so subjective that anyone could interpret it in such a way that they can use it to silence people who disagree with them. Incitement mm -hmm. to violence is objective. Whereas, so similarly with, with scientific theories, there will be a margin by on which we're like, no, this is a dangerous idea. You can't just go around teaching people that you can live off of oxygen because they could die. You know, there's consequences to like medics. There's some there's a category of medical information like, oh, you can cure COVID by drinking bleach. No, you'll die if you drink bleach. You cannot teach that to people. And we can all agree, yeah. nobody should be allowed to teach that drinking bleach is a medical treatment. Cool. But then, you know, outside of those extreme cases, it might be more subjective and um, people might, maybe should be allowed to express those ideas because, because maybe if they're not right, you know, like the free marketplace means the ideas which are most true or most beneficial should rise to the top because people will be like, oh, I want what he's having. That looks good. Or, you know, mm -hmm. that business is doing really well. I want to try what that business is doing so I can do well also with my business. And that's sort of how the free marketplace works. It, it, it finds the best among a number of options, which are, which we can't really tell which are best until we put them to the test. Of course, I have to be reflexive about this and see how what we've been talking about re re reflects on me and my work. You know, so... Uh, I have certain commitments that I've arrived at uh, in terms of my involvement with the Vedic knowledge system of India, which is vast. It has many branches, and the, the branch that I've associated myself with is Gaudiya Vaishnavism, which has a particular worldview and you know so i guess i have to ask myself you know from time to time how willing am i to modify my views on on the basis of scientific evidence and things like that and that kind of gets you into some deep epistemological issues um, <clears throat> on the relative authority of authoritative knowledge and what kind of evidence is available to your senses to reason about with your, with your mind. Now, David Chalmers, I was reading his, his book, Reality Plus, which came out this year. It's about this simulated reality hypothesis or topic. He said, how do you know you're not in a, a virtual reality system right now? Uh, it's kind of his version of uh, Descartes' dilemma. How do we, I mean, he said, you know, the, the only, Descartes said, the only thing we can know for sure is I think, they, therefore I am. Uh, anything else could be a deception by some satanic personality with vast powers. Uh, so, how do we know we're not in a virtual reality system right now? I thought it was interesting that Chalmers said the only way you, you could know for sure is if whoever made the virtual reality system kind of entered into it and told you that's what it is and here's how it's done. And you know, he said that authoritative testimony might be the only way that you could understand what the real situation is. He also mentioned this in connection with deep fake photographs and videos. You know, I mean, the technology is there now and it's constantly improving such that, you know, people can take an image of 
someone or a video of someone and make them say or do things that are they're absolutely not saying or doing. So he said, well, how ultimately are we going to be able to decide if something is uh, fake or not? In that sense, a deep fake image. So authoritative testimony by someone may be the only way to find out. So, I mean, that's uh, the big uh, issue that underlies all of these scientific questions and philosophical questions is that dichotomy between what we're able to figure out on the basis of what we observe and what we reason about and the testimony of some higher authority, which is usually some divine being or ultimately God. So I'm kind of confronted with that. At a, a meeting of the European Association of Archaeologists, I was asked a question. I had made a presentation of archaeological <coughs> evidence that's consistent with the accounts of extreme human antiquity that are found in the piranhas. And I was asked, what if you know, one of the organizers of this session in which I presented a paper asked me during the question session, what if we were able to show you that every single case that you've brought up is incorrect or doubtful and you accepted that? What, how would that influence your view of the Quranic idea of extreme human antiquity. So I thought about that. It was a, a, a good question. And I thought, and I said, well, it wouldn't necessarily change my idea of what the conclusion of the piranhas is on this topic, but it might influence me to stop trying to present that concept in circles like this. Uh, because basically, when I analyze myself, I see what I'm doing is I'm taking a Puranic conclusion that I accept on the basis of the authority of the Puranas, but I can't expect scientists who are part of a different epistemological system to accept any statement from the Puranas as evidence for something. So what I try to do is give them evidence in the categories that they accept. In other words, archaeological discoveries that are consistent with what the Puranas say. And if I'm able to do that, well, then I consider I've succeeded. If what I presented doesn't have that result, well, I might not change my point of view, but I might stop trying to represent it to them. Anyways, I'm just trying to turn this discussion back on, on, on me, because you know, we've said a lot about well, what scientists do and science studies people do and the general public does and but I sort of felt I had to turn it back on myself a little bit. I, I think that raises uh, an interesting epistemological discussion um, like like what you described it as it's very honest and uh, like I think that kind of present it's important to be consistent and honest like that. Uh, I like the answer you gave. 
um, the way I, I see it as being scientific nonetheless is because like I always like to make a distinction between philosophers and internet atheists or internet apologists so I mean we don't have strict terminology for this but I see the difference as the philosopher like for example someone like Graham Oppie he's a philosopher first and an atheist second um, so what that means for him is he'll he's just not currently convinced that a god any kind of anything like god exists and but he's got various arguments for the worldview he he believes and if you give him show him how one of his arguments fails he'll drop that argument whereas you take an internet atheist or an internet ap apologist show them how one of their arguments fails they'll probably just repeat the same argument louder and louder and tell you you're dumb for not accepting their argument kind of thing so that the what, what what you just described is you, you like there's a difference between my private reasons for believing something and my reasons why I think you should believe the same thing as me. So <laughs> you you have faith in the piranhas and you believe the worldview presented by the piranhas. I don't think there's any reason why anyone should object to that or get upset by that because that's your personal worldview. But if you were then want to say other people should also have faith in the piranhas you need to give them an argument. So the argument you use is, here's a bunch of scientific data which is consistent with the worldview of the piranhas. Um, so this leads credence to the story told by the piranhas. Uh, and, but then the way you're academic and intellectually honest about it is, you, is if, you're, if, you've, if it's found that the fossil cases you presented which show extreme human antiquity, if someone can show you that actually these aren't good evidence, you'll stop using them. Right. Whereas if, if you were intellectually dishonest, somebody could show you, oh, well, here's this particular fossil you present and here's various problems with it and why it actually doesn't tell the story which you're purporting that it tells. And if you were intellectually dishonest, uh, next time you were presenting a conference and that same person put their hand up and wanted to ask a question, you would make sure that person didn't get to open their mouth. And when you wrote a, your next book, you'd make sure that, that's, that you'd still present that case, but you'd leave out all the objections that were presented. Whereas, you know, the intellectually honest thing to do is here's my theory, here's my arguments, and here's the best objections to it that I can find. Uh, even if that argument you gave isn't the reason why you believe it, it could still be a reason why you can persuade other people to believe it. Yeah. Uh, even there, there are subtleties, of course. What, what I might admit is, uh, well, this group, is behaving more or less like you described the the uh, internet atheists, you know, as holding on to their idea no matter what. So you might decide, well, I won't have any further discussion with this person. So that's that's another possibility, but uh, the one that I gave and the one that you were re responding to is how I generally meant it. <clears throat> I don't know if that dis distinction is relevant, but but it occurred to me as. Uh, another way of looking at the situation as, as you were describing it. Oh, I, I can't hear Sorry. Oh, yeah. Hear you, you. you made me think of a, a book. I can't remember the name of the author, but um, he, he wrote a book showing many textbook examples that are given uh, in, in universities for arguments or reasons in favor of the theory of evolution. And he went through a series of these textbook examples to show how they've been debunked or, you know, at the time when they were discovered, it was thought that these were evidence for reincarnation, but now we found that they're wrong or there's other ways of interpreting them. Uh, and he points out how these, you know, even though these are, are arguments have been debunked, they're still in textbooks today. So that would be an example of the kind of intellectual dishonesty that I'm talking about. So, you know, like a scientist could believe in the theory of evolution because uh, 
you know, their favorite scientist told them it's true and they just believe everything that their favorite scientist tells says. I'd be like, cool, you're, you're welcome to believe that. But if you want to argue that other people should believe it, you can't expect that everyone else is going to have the same kind of faith in that particular scientist that you have. You need to give an argument. And if when that person's giving argument, you debunk some of the arguments, and then next time they give the arguments, they just make sure that the debunking that you gave is silenced, that's intellectually dishonest. Yeah. Uh, <clears throat> you know, it's, uh, I mean, arguments are based on premises. So usually you give a, a premise and a, more than one premise and they add up to a conclusion. So basically the way to dispute an argument or is to show that one of the premises is is wrong. <clears throat> so so we have to analyze you know the the arguments. You know like uh, in, in terms of the virtual reality and simulated worlds argument, you know that's put forward by Chalmers, for example, uh, he points out that a lot of people in the academic and scientific world consider virtual realities to be illusion or hallucination, not real. In other words, they don't like the term reality. They think reality is what we're experiencing. When you put on your virtual reality headset, you're you're in an illusion. It doesn't exist. And you know, it's interesting. He kind of, in his book, he makes use of analogies and examples from different cultures and traditions. He mentioned one that he got from studying some Vedic text. It had to do with uh, Narada Muni As and uh, Vishnu. So uh, Vishnu put Narada Muni for some reason into the body of a woman so he could experience life from that perspective and then when he was restored to his original position uh, Vishnu said well that was all just illusion and uh, Chalmers interprets it is that in the Indian spiritual tradition the Vedic spiritual tradition they think that reality, material reality, is an illusion in the same sense that the critics of virtual realities are calling it, calling virtual realities an illusion. In other words, that there's nothing there ultimately. However, that view is based on a, a misunderstanding. Like, Chalmers points out that the virtual reality is, it does have a physical basis. It does physically exist in terms of what's going on inside the computer with the, the bits, you know, being manipulated in the central process, processing unit. So, in this, so it is real, not in the same sense that this physical reality surrounding us is is real, but never real nevertheless. It actually is a pattern of bits you know, on a computer. In the same way, I would point out, contra, contrary to what David Chalmers said, in the Indian system, the realities that were placed in 
the virtual realities. Our, our present world is like a virtual reality. It's a reflection of the ultimate spiritual world. It, but this material world is not unreal. I mean, there's one school of thought that believes that. They have a, a slogan, Jagat Satyam, uh, no, Brahma Satyam Jagat Mityam, that uh, there's an ultimate spiritual reality, and this reality is a complete illusion. It doesn't really exist. Uh, really, it exists, but it's temporary. So it's you know, interesting how misunderstandings can enter the writings of very prominent scholars. Hmm. Um, back on that epistemology point we are talking about, there's one more thing I want to say. Um, I've been asked uh, a similar question from in the Q&A following debates. Uh, someone asked, it's come up a few times, what would it take for you to stop believing uh, in your Hare Krishna worldview? And the answer, one of the answers I gave was, um, so basically the reasons why I accept it is because the philosophy explains reality to me and it makes complete sense. So someone would have to show me f philosophical problems or ways in which this worldview is inconsistent with observable data. So, I mean, with hermeneutics, we, we will understand things to some extent based on our observations. So when there's a statement, the village is on the Ganga, we assume it means the village is on the bank of the Ganga because we, based on how we, our observation of reality, we know that villages can't be literally on a river. Um, so if someone would have to show me serious observational data that conflicts with the worldview presented uh, by the Bhagavatam. And the other, uh, I'm, I can't remember exactly how I worded it, but I think it was something like, uh, oh, the, the, the benefit that I get from, from practicing it, that, that would have to not be the case. Um, and also that the saintly character of the great teachers in the tradition would have to be shown to be false. And mm -hmm. I think some of those things are things that like, you know, I've, I've, the, the, I've, the witness that I, that I, the way I've witnessed the saintly character of Srila Prabhupada or by hearing about it, that's not something that can be debunked. It's, it's just an objective fact. Um, and that the way following this philosophy benefits my life personally, it's like trying to tell somebody that's sunbathing that they're not being heated by the sun. Yeah. Yeah, we're not just logic machines, although that's important. Um and it's important to exercise our intelligence. In the Bhagavad Purana or Srimad Bhagavatam, there's a section on Sankhya philosophy, enumerating the different elements and constituents of living things. And one of them is intelligence. And the first feature of intelligence, which is described in a functional sense in the Bhagavad Purana, is doubt. The ability to not just accept whatever the senses are pouring in and whatever's uh, coming into our consciousness from the environment, but the ability to stand back and doubt is it really like this or is it some other way so that uh, doubting faculty is part of intelligence according to this system of thought then the next thing that comes is the ability to apprehend things that are not really the case you know that you know, you could uh, see, for example, something that appears to be, you know, like when you're driving down the road and you see the illusion of water, you know, existing you know, on the road in front of you. But when you go there, you see actually there's not any water. That's, you know, some 
atmospheric effect or something. Then third is the ability to apprehend what the actual situation or fact is. And then the next faculty of intelligence is smriti, which means the ability to retain all of these uh, apprehensions. You know, the result of the doubt, the determining what's real, what's not real, to retain that and be able to employ it and use it. So uh, that is part of what we have to do in this world. Yeah, we're not logic machines, but we do need to have a correct understanding of things and our intelligence is there to help us do that. But beyond that, we also have to, we're, we're pleasure-seeking creatures. We want happiness and satisfaction. And if the practice of bhakti yoga, according to the teachings given in the scriptures of Gaudiya Vaishnavism, are giving us that practical way of living that results in a feeling of fulfillment and satisfaction and happiness, well, isn't even according to the modern standard, uh, the purpose of life, uh, the pursuit of happiness. You know, that's, so I think what you mentioned was very important, that kind of beyond being logically convinced of certain truths, uh, that uh, you find the practice of Krishna consciousness gives you uh, a certain state of being that would have to be, you could say, falsified, you know, that your sense of satisfaction or happiness would have to be falsified in order to get you to change. Is that more or less what you were saying yeah yeah that's it basically um one more thing i think it's useful to talk about is uh, there's this question like why do the people pushing the scientific consensus or the people upholding it care so much about disagreement like the flat earth theory is one that i really wonder about like why does it matter if a whole lot of people start believing the world is flat like they're still going to be able to drive their cars. I mean, maybe you need the airplane pilots to believe the Earth's a globe. Otherwise, they probably wouldn't be able to navigate to the correct locations because you need the globe Earth map in order for, to make sense of flight times. But in terms of everyday people, what does it matter if they have a few false beliefs? Why get it so upset about it? Um, I don't know. You'd have to ask them. <laughs> because I, I mean, the way that I look at it is if somebody accepts the flat earth theory and I don't for a few reasons but I believe it's their right to draw whatever conclusion they feel is warranted by the evidence or any other factor that influences how they make decisions as long as they're not trying to enforce it on other people against their will and, and i don't mean you know raising it in, in conversation i mean using the levers of government power or some other institution's power to force people to accept it as long as it's their opinion and they're persuading others to accept it i think there's nothing wrong with that and, it, and i would say if i were studying the landscape of 
the intellectual landscape of ideas about the earth, well, I'd have to say, well, this is a, an idea that has supporters today. They may not be the majority consensus, but they're there and they have their reasons. And they provide good entertainment. That's everybody has different tastes in entertainment, <laughs> but but uh, yeah, for some people it's entertaining. Um, I keep coming back to the idea of like where the margins are of ideas that should should get a fair hearing. So, like, if people want to believe the world's flat, go for it. But if you want to believe that you can raise your child vegan and not give them any supplements. There sh there, somebody should step in and, and, and make sure those children don't end up with neurological disorders as a result of becoming B12 deficient. Yeah, I, uh, I take a B complex vitamin, but uh, uh, there again, yeah, it's, uh, I haven't really deeply studied that question of what these people are saying and what the mainstream view is, so I'm just more or less accepting what you're saying about it. But uh, Well, I think traditionally I people maybe got B12 from drinking river water. We don't do that anymore, so you need to have take a B12 supplement or take dairy or meat. Mm -hmm. Well, I take dairy. Yeah. But you know, I, I find that medical decisions can be very personal and individual based on what people accept. Now, what one does for oneself is one question. What effect it has on others who aren't able to make decisions for themselves about it is another question so yeah well I, actually i was going to follow that point i made about because i mean the b12 thing is objective there's cases of children who are severely affected for the rest of their life because they were b12 deficient at a key stage of their development and that's an objective fact. Like we know B12 prevents that. We know the kid was on a diet that was B12 deficient and wasn't taking a B12 supplement. It's, there's not really much room for argument there. And you know, I mean, I'm not really attached to this particular argument. I'm just saying there's cases. Like I gave earlier the example of drinking bleach. We know drinking bleach is nothing yeah. but bad for you. Um, so somebody well, should try to try to make a distinction there between somebody like an adult who is able to make their own decision mm. and then a child not being informed and not being able to make their own decision that's that's another question yeah that that's an interesting now we're getting into a discussion on ethics <laughs> but we yeah. mean it's really it's it's very much tied into the epistemology thing we're discussing because yeah, all the examples I'm giving are of where we should draw a boundary. Are you know, I'm not saying a person shouldn't be allowed to drink bleach themselves. I mean, how do you really even stop someone from drinking bleach? I guess it would be in the category of suicide, maybe. Um, but definitely, they shouldn't be allowed to publicly profess that this is a cure, because they could that could have serious cause serious harm to other people. Um, <laughs> So, but like, like recently, I listened to this documentary about the kid who developed Silk Road, which is this website, black, uh, black dark web website where anybody could sell anything. And um, when they, I was, I was listening to the, the part where the the judge finally sentenced this guy, and he made this argument that he was just like a, like you know, sometimes illegal things are sold on Amazon. He was just a web admin. Uh, no, no. Oh, yeah, one of the arguments the kid made, and uh, the guy made in his defense was that um. Drugs are just a personal thing. People just choose to take drugs for themselves. And uh, it, it doesn't affect other people. It just affects the people taking the drugs. And the judge is like, no. Like, if someone becomes a junkie taking those drugs, that affects their family members, that affects their friends, that, that affects society. 
uh, it's not just affecting the person on themselves. So it's not just that the person choosing to take the drug is harming themselves. They're harming a lot of other people at the same time. Um, so this, yeah, that, that was one of the arguments the judge gave against this guy's defense. And I think that makes a bit of sense. But yeah, that's a whole ethical discussion, which would really be another subject. Um, yeah, it, it would be. <laughs> but yeah. I, would, I would have some things to say about that. Uh, like when I was young, um, you know, sometimes I would, you know, raise some point to my parents, my mother or father or someone about somebody said that, and they would say, you know, if somebody told you, you know, to jump off the bridge, would you do it? In other words, they expected, you know, a person to have some intelligence. Like if it was somebody telling me to drink bleach, I don't know that I would do it. Some people would, though. Yeah. So then it becomes, and then the other question you made, the person taking drugs, yes, it affects the family, it affects the friends, it affects the relatives. One assumes that the friends, family, and relatives have some agency. You know, they're not passive. They could use their family and relational and social influence over the person to to uh, try to persuade them or lead them to another path or or uh, <clears throat> in other words there are certain things that I, I suppose it depends upon as you say your philosophy of ethics and your philosophy of government <laughs> Yeah, you know, how intrusive should government be actually? What should be left to families and relatives and friends who have some relationship and influence over the person? And when government should be brought into the well into the matter. I mean, I think libertarianism can go too far. Like there's this guy, Jeff Burwick, who set up a community in Mexico on libertarian values. And th this has happened in the last couple of years. Um, and it's, somebody in the community was murdered by somebody else in the community. And it's in Mexico, a libertarian community where they don't believe in police. So what happens when someone gets murdered? <laughs> you, you, need, you need some amount of government oversight to step in and prevent murders and punish people who commit murders, right? Yeah, a, a, just a small community that I don't think it can really deal with that all on their own. And so similarly with the Silk Road thing, I mean, previously, say 100 years ago, the accessibility of these harmful substances was far less, and that meant less drug addicts. Whereas the Silk Road website meant that anyone could go on the web, with, get purchase a bit of Bitcoin, use a Bitcoin to buy any drug under the sun. So that... so. The argument, you know, the reason why this this guy who built this website was punished, he get he got two life sentences, uh, uh, the, is because of making these illegal substances so accessible. And like every now and again, somebody would get some party drug or maybe some lace drug, and and people died mm -hmm. from stuff they bought on that website. So, I think there's an argument to be made that that not just anybody should be able to sell anything to anyone because. Like, except for example, in Turangi, which is a, a small town in New Zealand, the gangs there decided that P, which is, um, I think they call it jib in North America. It's, uh, I think it's crack. The one they smoke, okay. the amphetamine that people smoke. They decided this drug is too bad. We're not having it in our community. So and gangs can do this because someone starts selling P, they just beat the crap out of them until <laughs> they leave that town and stop selling it. And I think that kind of thing is good. I think, you know... I think there's one thing people want to use marijuana for personal use, fine. That's not a criminal activity. But I think if you want to sell people a, a kind of amphetamine drug, which is objectively destroying people's lives, I think there's a special place in hell for that kind of person. You're just making money while you watch your customers destroy their lives. And you could just stop selling it to them. You could just make it inaccessible to them. Yeah. I think we've veered off topic a little bit. Um, 
but yeah, we're talking about epistemology and libertarian values. So I guess it's, it's very, well, yeah, the, we're talking about the, the free marketplace of ideas. And I think we need to have a fringe of yeah. ideas that aren't, aren't allowed to be pitched in the public that don't get a hearing. <clears throat> but those need to be such that everybody can agree. So we've got this sort of like, you know, like you could argue, there's a, there's a debate whether vitamin C prevents flus. That's cool. Have a debate about it. But like a pro- medical professional who says, take vitamin C, get lots of sun, or take vitamin D, exercise, eat a healthy lifestyle. If, if a doctor wants to prescribe that, they should be allowed to do that. And another doctor wants to put people on pharmaceuticals, they should be allowed to do that. And, you know, people can go to the different doctors and say, well, the people that go to this doctor are, are healing faster or having less side effects than the people that go to this doctor. And that's what I mean by the free marketplace of ideas. But you do need... a, a a medical establishment that that makes sure that people who get this title are sufficiently educated to to be able to know what they're talking about whereas a hundred years ago before we had that kind of medical establishment all sorts of people were doing all sorts of horrendous things to people in the name of medicine and often making their patients far worse off and now that we have like some kind of medical education system uh there's a few checks and balances and it's better than it was Again, these are deeply personal questions. I mean, personally, I I go to the Western allopathic health system, but I know some people, for various reasons, avoid it, and it it. I I don't think one can say that there are no problems. Yeah, you with know, no, the modern medical system. Uh, you know, that's, I mean, if you look at its history, you'll see that all the way up to the present. But uh, <clears throat> I think on, on the balance, I mean, my personal approach is I, I take, take advantage of that system because it's it's good at certain things but i know i also know others who avoid it as much as possible and rely on things like ayurveda and other types of healing healing regimes that go under different names so um, I feel I kind of have to respect those decisions that these individuals make. Yeah. I mean, I gave that, that diet and lifestyle treatment example because I heard of a doctor in New Zealand who would do things like someone comes to him with depression and they tell them to eat a banana every day and go for a walk instead of prescribing antidepressants. And this person got struck off. Yeah because they weren't prescribing enough pharmaceuticals. Um, yeah, we should probably wrap it up soon. Uh, are there any other points you wanted to make? Um, well, just that this was an interesting conversation. Yeah, we started out speaking about how sometimes scientists or different branches of science start behaving in a very authoritarian manner as if they were uh, priests of some kind of religious group that had the authority to speak the ultimate truth to the to the public and <clears throat> That's a view that many, even you know, in the field of science studies, historians and philosophers of science, have problematized over the past few decades. But some of them, they're worried about maybe they've gone a little bit too far either in terms of the influence they've had on society in general or within strictly within the uh, the uh, academic realm. Uh, Bill Lynch had pointed out 
in his book, uh, Minority Report, that in, in the uh, 1980s, around that period, science studies had been confronted with a choice uh, whether they were going to be able to present a full critique of modern science, including examining its commitment to physicalism or materialism. To do that full critique, he said, we understood that we would probably have to pull ourselves out of the academy or that we wouldn't be allowed to remain in it. And he gave historical examples of how, uh, for example, in Germany in the 19th century, a, a school of philosophers called the Young Hegelians had been totally ostracized, marginalized, denied posts as professors in the German education system. So I said, we, we may be in a situation like that. So there were kind of two groups in the science studies community. One that said, okay, we have to moderate our tone here and our ideas. And those who wanted to push on with a full-scale critique and you know the moderates kind of won out but uh it it just shows something about what goes on behind the scenes sometimes yeah cool you you mentioned a few books maybe we can put a few links to some of them in the description in case anyone wants to read more yeah bill lynch minority report and uh, Stephen Fuller, uh, Post Truth, I think is the title of his book, oh. and Paul Fire Up and Against Method. And maybe we could end. You could you could tell some of your personal experience with presenting objective scientific data, uh, and how that's been pushed back on and ways that weren't so objective? Well, I mean, this sort of thing does happen. I, I, uh, I, I could give some, some examples. I, I gave one, which I regarded as a, a very good one when I was questioned at, at the European Association of Archaeologists meeting and Finland, Helsinki, Finland. Uh, I explained how one of the organizers of the session I was in questioned me about my commitment to the piranhas, but I thought that was totally legitimate, a, a legitimate question to raise. More on, I think, what you're talking about is, you know, once I was on a lecture tour of universities in Russia. This was some years ago. Uh, but I was scheduled to give a, a lecture on forbidden archaeology at uh, the university in Tumen, uh, Russia. It's a city in Russia. Some professors had invited me to speak. Other professors found out about the lecture and they tried to get it canceled. Uh, and they went to the rector of the universities, it's kind of like equivalent to the president, and said, well, we can't have this person speaking here. First of all, he's opposing the theory of evolution, and second, and perhaps more seriously, he's doing it from some kind of spiritual perspective. Uh, Vedic perspective. So the lecture was canceled. But then, and I, I would take that as an example of 
an ideological commitment to a certain idea that really wasn't purely scientific in the sense of just being based on evidence and argument. It seemed to have been based on some prior commitment that was more of an ideological nature. But anyways, the professors who invited me went to the director of the local branch of the Russian Academy of Sciences, and he said, okay, if they won't let him speak at the university, he can speak here. I regarded that as enlightened. And uh, the professors who invited me told me more people came than would have come if the lecture had been held at the university because everybody was wondering what is this man going to say that's so dangerous <laughs> yeah. that his, his talk was canceled so yeah you, you do run into or i have you know personally run into uh these kind of things. It's not that it's always like that. It's sort of a, a rare occurrence. So I think that uh, many scientists, a good percentage of them, are open-minded, that they accept the current theories for more or less scientific reasons. You know, it's not because of some ideological commitment that they refuse to listen to anything else. They are willing to listen to alternatives, and I'm grateful for that. Now, then it's up, kind of up to me to persuade them. And whether I'm able to do that, I think that depends upon, upon, upon me and my abilities so but yes the kind of thing that you talked about does arise it arose when i was invited to speak at google headquarters in mountain view california i think in 2017 you know some employees tried to get the lecture canceled and they didn't succeed. So, I mean, they were arguing, we're a science-based organization, and this person is against a major scientific theory. And, yeah, but, but the lecture went on, even though that kind of attempt was, was made. And I think that's to the credit of... Uh, people in in the world today that they're at least willing to listen to a, a new idea not to try to exclude it or shut it out if it's an interesting idea listen to it if you're persuaded fine if you're not fine but it's it back to what you were talking about the free market of ideas yeah right. Um, yeah, I was impressed that, that Google um, invited you to speak. That that that's pretty cool. So yeah, it sounds like what well, you're saying is it's not that the Google management invited me to speak. They just have a program where employees can suggest authors to speak at Google, and <clears throat> yeah, so they have a program like that, and some employees there did propose that I be a speaker. I guess you could say there's ultimately some involvement of management in some way, but it's not that uh, the, who are the two founders, Bryn and someone else, that, that they got together and decided let's yeah, right. invite Michael Primo, but some of their employees did and they the whatever connection with management there is allowed the lecture to take place. And yeah, it was 
really good. I've seen the recording of it. There were lots of good questions at at the end of it. So, so, so that was a good experience. It sounds like what you're saying is uh, within the scientific field, there's a number of people that are actually just interested in truth. And if you present good counter arguments, they'll consider them. They may not be convinced, yeah. but they'll give them a fair hearing. But then you yeah. also get a number of them that are will just defend whatever their beliefs are of the scientific consensus yes. and try to silence dissenting views at any cost. Exactly. Maybe not at any cost, but they'll give it a priority. Well, they'll try to get a lecture canceled. They don't want to hear it. They don't want anybody else to hear it. And mostly it appears to be because of a prior commitment to some epistemological or ontological position like atheism or physicalism or or just authoritarianism you know yeah. it, 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 I don't really put them in the category of this other group which is open-minded that they, they may be supporters as i said of the current theories but they're willing to change their minds based on evidence and argument and mm-hmm. they're willing to listen to alternatives that are presented in a certain way that's acceptable to them yeah that's I what mean, edward dutton would call the uh, artistic obsession with the truth like the the autistic quality is like uh, someone with autism could be arguing that something's true, be really emphatic, have a big argument, and then they find out that they're wrong, and they're just there's no cool off period. It's just like oh, I was wrong. Okay, you're right, and on to the next thing. Whereas a neurotypical person will be embarrassed, and there'll be a cool off period, and so on. Um, and yeah, the autistic obsession with truth. There's no false ego about it. It's it's it's. I just want to know what the truth is, even if I find out I've been wrong my whole life or whatever it is. So you get a number of people like that in the scientific community. Yes. Um, what you just said also made me think of a, an interesting uh, parallel we we could imagine. So you talked earlier about how you believe in extreme human antiquity because the Puranas tell you that's the case. And really, it goes back to your faith in the Puranas. So, and just now, you were talking about how some of these scientists who will try to silence dissenting views, they don't necessarily believe um, some of the views they hold for scientific reasons. They may believe them due to prior commitments they have based on atheism, and they want to have a that so they want to accept only scientific data or scientific theories which are consistent with their prior commitments which is some kind of atheism or physicalism so you know going back to your epistemology with accepting the piranhas first and then looking for things that are consistent with the piranhas um, similarly the the atheist scientist could be doing the exact same thing but for an alternative worldview where for prior reasons i accept physicalism and atheism uh, therefore, I will only permit theories that are consistent with that. But the difference between what you described is you're you're honest about it. You're like, yeah, this is the reason why I believe this worldview, but these are the arguments I'll give of why you should believe it. Whereas uh, the atheist who's you know at, who's maybe doing this is saying, as here's the reasons why I believe it, but I'm not self-aware of those reasons, and I'm not going to be honest about it. Maybe because I'm not self-aware, or maybe because I'm not intellectually honest. So here's what I'm going to tell everybody are my reasons for believing it, and here's what I'm going to here's the reasons why I think everyone else should believe it. And they'll conflate those two even when they're not the same thing. Yeah, I think that's a good analysis. I would also say that uh, coming to accept the Puranas was did involve on my part. Uh, logic and reason and comparison with other worldviews and things like that. It's not that I was born into this tradition and just accepted it because it it was told to me as a child, rather as as a fairly 
adult person, a young adult, but nevertheless, uh, in my early 20s, you know, I had seen and investigated a lot of things before I became persuaded about what the Puranas were saying. And even then, I have reasons, well, they're perhaps related to the Puranic cosmology. I have other reasons for accepting that humans like us have been present on this planet for a long time. Yeah, right. Yeah, you have the scientific data. Even beyond the scientific data, just the logical point. And this gets back to the whole simulated worlds question. Uh, a simulated world is obviously designed for a purpose. Uh, you know, those who are kind of into speculating about these things propose that scientists somewhere else in the cosmos are running experiments, you know, testing out different possibility, possible futures, and things like that, and they're running perhaps millions or billions of simulations. So they would have a purpose, which allows you to introduce the concept of design. So kind of as related to that is that according to the Puranas, the universe is sort of like a simulated reality and it does have a purpose. And that purpose is to educate a conscious self in such a way that it comes to understand it is not from this simulated world that it's embedded in. It's from some external reality. And this education is done in the human form of life. So if the purpose of the universe is to provide that education to souls and human bodies, it kind of makes sense to me that those bodies should have been available from the very beginning of the manifestation of the material universe which is a reflection of a eternally existing spiritual world. So, anyways, that's right. Yeah, that's a good point. Yeah, I, I like to put it uh, my reasons for believing the Harry Krishna worldview into three categories, which is my experience of being benefited by following this philosophy, um, the philosophical consistency of it. So, logical reasons, which are broken into two categories: philosophical consistency, philosophical arguments. Um, and then consistency with observed reality uh, or a, a ability to explain uh, the way reality is. So, you know, there's all these scientific theories, but none of them can fully explain reality. I, I think the worldview that we get from the Puranas can fully explain reality as we observe it. And then the third category of reasons for believing it is the saintly character of people who follow this teachings or you know people who are as we understand it descended to um, present these teachings to us does that include us <laughs> <laughs> well no i mean in, in any given religion no, you're going to no, have people no, who no. who use it to who have you know various bad qualities in their heart and they'll use the philosophy to defend their own bad qualities and you know, people who only follow it partially or people who are following it fully, um, but they've only just got into the bath and they're still covered in dirt. Yeah. Yeah, that's that's my category. <laughs> cool. All right. So shall we wrap it up there? Any final points? Um, final points. I don't know. People could visit my website, have a look at what books are available. 
mcremo.com, m-c-r-e-m-o.com. Yeah, for, for better than archaeology is really interesting. There's what an audio version of it on Audible, which is very truncated, very, very much abridged. I was quite disappointed with how short it was, but there's some interesting yeah. uh, data in there. And the basic main thing you show in there is how the, the way data is handled is inconsistent. I think the audio book is of the abridged version of Forbidden Archaeology. Yeah, I was just saying that the audio book is of the abridged version, the hidden history of the human race. Ah, oh, right, yeah. So it's much more manageable for people. But you get the basic idea in there of how there's an inconsistency of how data is handled depending on whether it, it fits with the prevailing worldview. It would be far more consistent if the scientists just said, well, here's all this data. It doesn't fit with our theory. And so, you know, we've got cognitive dissonance about it, but let's just park it here. And maybe another theory will come along one day that explains all of this. But for now, we don't well, know what to do with it. I've more or less said the same thing to them that you just said. You know, once I was speaking at the Free University in Amsterdam in, in Europe, and I was speaking to an audience of graduate students of archaeology, geology, and paleontology. And I said, we should just keep this entire data set in view, not you know, cast part of it into oblivion. And you know, I told them, what? I'll leave it up to you to divide the data set up into this is very reliable, this is questionable, this is totally off the wall, but keep the entire data set in view because something that may not make sense today may make sense in light of future discoveries. And in that way, that data, that evidence will be available to you. Whereas if you just get rid of it, because it doesn't conform to whatever idea you have today, you're missing out on something. Yeah. So I've made that exact same point that well, you were mentioning. Well, also, if you filter the data out, I mean, there's lots of more recent examples we could give of this kind of way of being unscientific with data. But to stick with the topic we're talking about, if every time a fossil is discovered that shows extreme human antiquity, it's not recorded, then we'll have no idea how many of them there are. And unless you're collecting the data, you can't find a pattern. Yeah, or it may be recorded, but not in a totally complete way or you know, in a way that I don't want to say misrepresents because the scientists who are recording the data may not think they're misrepresenting something, but you know, one has to carefully consider everything. Yeah, yeah right. Cool. All right. Thanks for coming on. Um, yeah, people can go check out Michael Kramer's book and uh, his, his books are, are really good and do a good job of robustly examining some of these d the, the data for extreme human antiquity and other alternative views well thank you very much Arjun good to be with you and all your viewers and listeners one more time